if we, <coughs> for simplicity, just group um, the ancient wisdoms together across, um, well, essentially the Mediterranean countries and uh, um, those bordering it, right? <coughs> and we compare that ancient, call it ancient wisdom, group them all as that, and compare that to all the various branches of um, Christianity and uh, marginal groups that are also pretty big too, you know, Jehovah's Witness, um, Seventh-day Adventist, um, the Mormons, basically anyone that uses the Bible as their fairly central um, scripture, at least officially anyway. I mean, they may use the Book of Mormon as well, or um, or really be wedded to, say, Ellen White, or the general teaching of whoever founded their particular group. And then if we said, well, what's the strengths and weaknesses, or what's the attraction and aversion one might have for for the two of them, comparing them. The ancient wisdom was um, of all people, ultimately, if you like going to the, is it the illusion fields or something, you know, the going to heaven, basically speaking, being perfected or coming through, no longer having to return, say, to lower worlds or worlds like this or what have you. And the, uh, the Christ was within, within each of us. And um, that was the guiding light. Christian religion, on the other hand, has the strength that um, the real guidance is in, in God. Um, certainly the Jesus teaching is that it, it's God. The Christian relig religion is that it's Jesus. Um, although there's some sort of fudge going on, it, whether it's both God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit in you. But the point is, there is a personal God there, very personal, that you can relate to. From the Jesus point of view, you would say he's Father. From the Christian point of view, you could say he's Jesus, a person, friendly person. You know, he loves children, he's kind to animals, he's a <laughs> super St. Francis sort of thing, you know. Um, there's much less of that, and you could say hardly at all, in the ancient wisdom. It's very much, uh, again, an individualist thing unlike Hebrew religion, which was um, for the salvation of the nation, principally, um, which rested on what the individuals were doing, but it was the nation that was being rescued into preeminence for the world order to come, sort of thing. As Christianity brings this notion of a loving God who's very personal, the ancient wisdom brings this thing that, well, we're not having half the planet going to hell. We're all getting to heaven in a sense in the end. Um, so rather more user-friendly, if you like. It's not um, overshadowed by some terrible judgment at the end of time, but more a continual judgment going on as to what your spirituality is. To some extent, Christianity, per se, has lost much of the notion of um, your salvation turning upon your integrity and your, um, your spiritual stature. It now depends in Christianity upon, uh, or quite simply, a blind acceptance of bringing Jesus into your life and um, accepting the 
noble sacrifice, the payment that's been made for your, your sins. Um, I don't mean Christianity is not arguing at all for integrity, but it's not um, the key that gets you in. The key that gets you in is belief on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you should be saved if you're talking about the nonconformist church. Not so with Jesus, of course. If, if you follow the Jesus teaching of the Gospels, not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Ah, that's a bit stricter. And that's more in line with the ancient wisdom. The story itself in Christianity is basically, of course, the ancient wisdom. It's an absolute conglomeration of the lot all pulled together, but literalized. We're saying, this is not myth. This is not legend. This is history. This happened, says Christianity. Um, it's documented. It's documented in the Bible, basically. It's not reliably documented anywhere else. Not at all reliably, not remotely reliably, and hardly at all anyway. Christianity presents, therefore, as the most reliable and most tangible, except that the evidence is so slim and extremely suspicious in following the ancient religion as regards um, storyline. You know, miraculous birth, water into wine, raising Lazarus, blind seeing, calming storms, all that stuff. Uh, crucifixion, um, you know, put on a cross, beaten, um, Resurrection, yes, and in three days, yes, and at, what's it, the autumn, the winter solstice, uh, sorry, at the spring equinox, Easter, yes, it all coincides, it all matches line for line. I mean, there's hardly an original piece in the Gospels, hardly an original statement or an original um, miracle and in that sense you just despair at it being history there is no way this can be literal history and such an incredible copy of the ancient wisdom that's been running not just for a few hundred years before but for thousands of years before the time Jesus is supposed to have been on the earth so the literalism loses its strength then, and you're back to it's a variant of the mystery religions, the mystery cults. It's the variant applied to the Hebrew nation. And there was a variant for almost every nation. You know, um, Persia, North Africa, uh, all, of the, all the countries seem to have had their version of the great... Um, the God who dies is dismembered, um, you know, miraculously born, resurrected, and is for the people, concerned for the poor. Um, and it's the popular people's religion. Hebrew religion said nothing about the afterlife. The dead sleep. Jesus' teaching follows through on the Daniel approach. There's an afterlife, there are angels, there are super beings and so on. Angels in heaven, Jesus talks of. It's a perfection of the Persian view. But all of the ancient mystery comes down to overwhelming influence from Egyptian, ancient Egypt. Um picking up on uh, things like karma and reincarnation, but not having that 
terrible end of time judgment that um, Christianity has so treasured in the book of Revelation and various comments to such in the Gospels and so on. Where is Paul in this? Well, he's clearly Gnostic Christian. He is what made um, the Christian religion, the church, and he almost certainly was writing before the time that the Jesus story was written, which is the reason for him not knowing details that we have in the Gospels. Otherwise, for certain, he would have used them as justification for his theology instead of always referring to what we call the Old Testament. He's clearly um, what we would say is charismatic. He's um, he's Gnostic. He's um, he's been written over and rewritten and reinterpreted by the Church. But he uses the jargon of the mystery, mystery cults. And I might say, gave the very foundation for Christianity being a mystery cult. Of all people that turned it into a cult, it's St. Paul. And the head of that cult is Paul's view of theology. It's not the Jesus we read And it's not referred to as Jesus either, but the Christ. The Christ is a very familiar understanding for the ancient mysteries. It's the Christ within you, the hope of glory, as Paul says. Nothing is clean and crisply so, and I may have said it as such, and it's not true. But in a rough and ready way, that's the basic structure. Right, famous last words, let's put that issue to rest. <laughs> Thank you, Dad.